Welcome to the Cleveland Clinic Stroke VGR program for CME credits on the latest breaking information in the world of cerebrovascular disease. Today, Dr. Shazam Hussein of the Cleveland Clinic is speaking. He is a Canadian trained neurologist who completed an endovascular fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Cerebrovascular Center. He is currently the head of the stroke program there and is an assistant professor in neurology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western University. Today he will be speaking about interventional therapeutic techniques in acute stroke. Welcome, Dr. Hussein. Thank you for the invitation to present this stroke virtual grand rounds, and I'll be speaking on the topic of interventional therapeutic techniques in acute stroke. And here are my disclosures. I do serve as the local PI for the SWIFT Prime study, as well as on the steering committee for the positive study. There will be some off-label use of therapies discussed in this talk. The objectives of this talk, we were going to learn how to apply some of the growing evidence for time-based treatment for acute stroke. I'd like to review the new guidelines that are out there for the use of TPA for acute stroke, as well as talk about a little bit about some of the new data from randomized controlled trials of acute stroke treatment. Now, stroke, uh, as we all know, is still a major problem. It is listed as the fourth leading cause of death, and perhaps more importantly, it is the leading cause of disability in North America. Uh, actually, due to its prominence in, the, uh, in, in China and in Asia, it probably is going to become the leading cause of death and disability worldwide in the very near future. And we estimate somewhere between one in five women and one in six men will have a stroke in their lifetime. This leads in the United States to a direct and indirect cost of stroke estimated to be about $73.7 billion. This chart really does emphasize how important time is in the situation of an acute stroke. It's estimated that in the situation of an acute stroke, we lose approximately 2 million brain cells per minute. And that it can be a huge number. And this is why we emphasize strongly that acute stroke therapy should be delivered in a timely fashion. Now, the main study we use uh, that, that provided evidence for the treatment of acute stroke was the NINS-TPA trial published in 1995 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a, a very good trial, uh, 624 total patients who were randomized between receiving either IV TPA or placebo within a zero to three hour time window. Uh, there were some strict parameters in terms of the delivery of IV TPA, uh, including the blood pressure parameter of one, less than 185 over 110. And they did assess three month outcomes assessed by Barthel Index, Modified Rank and Score, NIHSS, as well as the Glasgow Outcome Scale. As you can see from the graph of the results, they saw a very nice benefit for IV TPA. This was a 12% absolute risk reduction and a 32% relative risk reduction for the IV TPA treated patients in the outcome of minimal or no disability, a very strongly significant result. Uh, this, of course, uh, TPA is a very potent clot busting medication, and there is some risk of hemorrhage. And in the TPA, in this TPA trial, we saw a 6.4% risk of symptomatic hemorrhage in the TPA-treated patients versus a 0.6% in the placebo arm. Uh, despite that, you do see, though, that there really there was no difference in the mortality with, uh, between the two groups. And really, in, in further subgroup analyses that have been performed, we see that the benefit is observed in all patient subgroups and in all stroke subtypes. Now, looking at this effect in medicine, this is one of the most robust effects in medicine. Uh, if we do a little graph here to compare the different numbers needed to treat or NNTs for different therapies that we you know, are, feel are very well established, we see that IV TPA falls right in the middle there with a the number needed to treat of eight. And so this is a very, very potent and a very medication that has a very good effect on patients. Uh, that brings us to question one then. Based on the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke Time Targets for the Management of Acute Ischemic Strokes, which of the following items should be completed within 25 minutes of arrival in the emergency department? In intravenous TPA administration, non-contrast CT, aspirin and rectal administration, clopidogrel or, or oral administration, or bedside swallowing evaluation? And the answer to this question is that the non-contrast CT is what is required within 25 minutes. And this, again, uh, comes back to the issue of timely treatment uh, in the situation of an acute stroke. So the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke have set up national guidelines 
which have been adopted uh, nationwide and actually are u- utilized around the world. And what we like to see in this situation is that from the time the patient arrives at the hospital or the door time to the time that they say a physician should be around 10 minutes, the time for to when a neurologist should be informed about the case should be 15 minutes, and then the door to CT time when that CT scan is being performed should be 25 minutes. The door being to the read of that CT scan should be within 45 minutes, and that allows us then to hopefully have all the information we need to allow us to deliver the treatment within 60 minutes of that patient's arrival. And it's, 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 it's very important that we try to stick to these parameters as much as possible because it has been shown that patients' outcomes are better if we can get this TPA administered within that 60-minute golden hour. Our second question then is, all the following represent an exclusion to intravenous TPA for acute ischemic stroke within three hours, except either history of intracranial hemorrhage, INR greater than 1.7, NIH stroke scale score greater than 25, a blood glucose of less than 50, and a history of a brain contusion four weeks ago. And the answer to this question is number three, an NIH stroke scale score of greater than 25. And these uh, guidelines come now from the new uh, American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines that were published in 2013. Uh, what I'd like to do next is take us through a discussion of the new guidelines as compared to the older guidelines that had been published previously. Uh, we can see here the previous uh, guidelines are listed there on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, in terms of 2013 guidelines, they have simplified things uh, quite a bit. In terms of now, they have very specific inclusion criteria where we really want to see a diagnosis of ischemic stroke causing a measurable neurologic deficit. The onset of symptoms, again, these are guidelines from zero to three hours, so we're looking at the onset of symptoms to be within that window. And really, these are uh, criteria that apply to adults, so they're uh, asking for patients who are age 18 or greater. In terms of the exclusion criteria, they've actually simplified these and uh, really uh, divided these up into absolute and relative contraindications. Um, And so you can see the exclusion criteria listed there. Uh, Particularly of note uh, is that they have made now comment about the use of direct thrombin inhibitors or direct factor 10A inhibitors. And if there is any elevated uh, laboratory tests such as PTT, INR, platelet count, or ECT times, Uh, that really that would disqualify someone from being uh, administered IV TPA. Uh, We presently at the Cleveland Clinic have been using a 48-hour window that if patients have received these agents within 48 hours, that we should be very cautious with the use of IV TPA in that population. Uh, In patients who have minor rapidly improving stroke symptoms, we must be cognizant of some of the recent data that has shown that patients in that situation may actually end up with substantial disability. There are estimates that approximately one-third of these patients may actually be dead or severely disabled if you look at uh, their outcomes at three months after their stroke symptoms. And so this may be a group of patients where we have to carefully consider the risk and benefit of the IVTPA, and they may be a patient population that where IVTPA may be warranted. Other situations include those who have had recent surgery or recent bleeding. Uh, again, careful consideration about the severity of the stroke and the potential for risk and benefit uh, would have to be undertaken. Uh, They've also taken out a few of the wording of certain criteria. One is that uh, caution should be exercised in treating patients with major deficits. We obviously always want to use caution when using a medication like IV TPA, Uh, but patients with major deficits uh, do have a substantial disability from stroke, and so that should be considered in the risk-benefit equation. And in addition, they've removed the criteria that patient or family members uh, have to explicitly understand the potential risks and benefits for treatment. Uh, It is general consensus now now that because the medication is approved by the FDA in the zero to three hour window, that this would be considered the standard of care treatment for patients. And uh, this then could be proceeded upon if, for example, we have a patient who cannot communicate and cannot fully understand the risk, and yet there's no family members to be able to give uh, consent for the treatment that we should be able to still administer the IV TPA. Uh, Of course, in any of these situations, I think uh, if the patients or the families are available, we should be trying to discuss with them risks and benefits to make them understand and uh, consent for therapy. Uh, This next slide uh, illustrates the summary of the inclusion, exclusion, and relative exclusion criteria, and these would now be the standard uh, that is used in the United States. 
Now, again, coming back to the time question, uh, we certainly know that uh, the time, uh, like the time of benefit for IVTPA, extends past the three-hour window. Um, and when we looked at this in a pooled analysis of the Atlantis, ECAS, and NINS TPA trials, it was really found that the benefit of IVTPA extended out to four and a half hours, which led to increasing interest in utilizing the therapy, perhaps beyond the three-hour window. And so the evidence from the meta-analysis as well as other factors led to the uh, performance of the ECAS-3 trial, which uh, provides us our evidence for the use of IVTPA in the three to four and a half hour window. This was actually initially a requirement of the European regulatory agencies to assess the effectiveness of TPA after three hours. And in this trial, they, had, they took patients with acute ischemic stroke who were aged 18 to 80 years of age uh, and administered TPA between three and four hours post-symptom onset. Later, once this pooled analysis was published, it, w it allowed us to extend this time window out to four and a half hours. Now, the exclusion criteria of this ECAS-3 trial was very similar to the NINS-TPA trials, with the exception of a few categories where patients were felt to be at increased risk of hemorrhage, and those were the patients who were age 80 or greater, those who had severe strokes of NIH stroke scale scores of greater than 25, and the combination of previous stroke and diabetes mellitus. And as you can see by this next slide, looking at the outcome result, we saw, again, a positive result for IVTPA in this time window with a favorable outcome at 52.4% versus 45.2% and a very reasonable symptomatic ICH rate. Uh, now, you see by the numbers they, were, they reported a 2.4% versus 0.2%, which looks very good, but uh, they did use a slightly different definition. If we take that back to the NINS, t NINS trial definition of hemorrhage, it was a 7.9% versus a 3.4%. 5% difference. And again, as was seen with the NINS-TPA trial, there was really no difference in the mortality between the two groups. Now on to question three, which of the following statements regarding the use of IVTPA in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke is true? One, it is FDA approved for use within four and a half hours of stroke onset. Two, it is FDA approved within three hours of stroke onset and supported by national and international guidelines for use within three to four and a half hours of stroke onset. Three, IVTPA is not FDA approved for use in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. And four, is given to all patients with acute stroke symptoms. And the answer here is number two, it is FDA approved for use within three hours of stroke onset and is supported by national and international guidelines for use within three to four and a half hours of stroke onset. Uh, the FDA uh, uh, did not decide to extend labeling on IVTPA following the ECAS-3 trial. Uh, despite that, though, uh, both American guidelines as well as guidelines from Canada and Europe have really advocated for the use of IVTPA in the three to four and a half windows and is really general consensus in the stroke community is that it is a useful medication and should be offered in that time window. Uh, the next slide does again go through some of the from the 2013 guidelines. There are slightly again different inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, we do want to see a diagnosis of ischemic stroke with measurable neurologic deficit uh, with the onset of symptoms between three to four and a half hours. And these again are considered relative exclusion criteria age greater than 80, a severe stroke with an NIH of greater than 25, if they're taking an oral anticoagulant regardless of INR, as well as have a history of both diabetes and prior stroke. These would all can be considered relative exclusion criteria for the use of IVTPA in this time window. However, uh, given, uh, again, the benefit-risk equation, there may be certain patients who have some of these relative exclusion criteria who may still be good candidates for IVTPA. I'd like to shift gears and speak a bit about endovascular stroke therapy. Uh, three trials were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in February 2013, which are considered, uh, quote, negative trials for endovascular therapy. These included synthesis expansion, MR rescue, and the interventional management of stroke trial three. I think it's important for us to review these trials and understand some of the limitations uh, as to know what, how best to apply endovascular stroke therapy in our patient populations. Uh, for this particular talk, I'll spend most of my time speaking about the Interventional Management of Stroke Trial 3, or IMS-3 trial. This was a trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. Uh, it was run by Dr. Joe Broderick and his group out of the University of Cincinnati. Uh, this was based on prior data from the IMS-1 and 2 pilot trials that demonstrated that combined IVIA treatment for recanalization may be more effective than standard IVTPA with a very similar safety profile. 
And as you can see from the circle there, that the odds ratio for outcome has had about a two-fold benefit in the IMS-1 trial as compared to historical controls from the NINS-DPA trial, with the second circle here showing that the safety uh, the, in terms of symptomatic ICH seemed to be very similar to the rates we would expect from IVTPA alone. And so the IMS-3 trial was then designed, uh, this was basically a randomized controlled trial in patients who presented within three hours of symptom onset where they were randomized to either IVTP alone at standard dose of 0.9 milligram per kg versus combined IVTPA at a dose of 0.6 milligrams per kg with adjunctive endovascular therapy. Now this could, con uh, could cons consist of just IATPA, and that's why they actually use the reduced dose of IVTPA to allow a little bit of a dose to be delivered interarterially if necessary. Uh, it also allowed the use of one FDA-approved device, and, and, uh, and credit to the uh, individuals who designed the trial, they did uh, allow for devices that would be a future in the future approved by the FDA and so we do see the use of also penumbra aspiration device as well as a solitaire stent retriever, which were, were, were approved by the FDA during the course of this clinical trial. Now, the IMS-3 trial uh, it ended up enrolling 656 patients in a two-to-one design. This meant uh, three, 434 patients in the combined IVIA arm versus 222 patients in the IVTPA alone arm. And they ended up stopping the trial early for reasons of futility. And that, that was because when they got to one of the pre-specified uh, analysis points, they found, based on that, that they were not going to be able to prove that IVIA was going to be superior to IVTPA alone. Uh, this is very important to note that this was not stopped due to safety concerns. It was really due to an issue that they were not going to be able to prove the superiority of the combined IVIA therapy. Uh, looking at time to treatment, and this may be one of the key elements to why the trial was not successful, uh, we see that in the, the patients who received the IVTPA, which is on the bottom part of the graph there, uh, the time from their arrival to the hospital to administration of IVTPA was about 65 minutes. And uh, so this is a little bit longer than what we would set as our national standard of uh, 60 minutes of door-to-needle time. On the top part of the graph, though, is where it gets more interesting, where we see that the patients who went to IA therapy actually had a pretty substantial delay in getting actually to uh, the interventional suite. And even once they got groin puncture, which is indicated in the green part of the graph there, that it took actually 44 minutes for once the groin puncture was obtained to actually receiving IA treatment. And then for your time from onset to IA therapy was sitting at around 249 minutes. And looking at the time from onset to IA therapy, uh, it was sitting at around 249 minutes. Uh, so we can see that there seem to be pretty substantial delays in the administration of the IA therapy. And given what we know about the importance of time in this situation and the potential of poor outcomes the longer that it takes to get vessels opened up, this could have impacted their clinical results. Uh, the next slide here shows the primary outcome in the patients of the clinical trial, and we can see again that there was no significant difference between the two arms of the study. Uh, they were looking at their primary outcome at the patients who had a modified Rankin scale score of two or less. Uh, there was perhaps a trend towards better outcomes with the endovascular therapy arm in patients who had very severe strokes of NIHs of 20 or greater, uh, but again, this was not statistically significant. And if we move on to the secondary outcomes, really no significant benefit in any subgroup that was pre-specified to be analyzed. Uh, there was a trend towards better outcomes, again, when looking at the time element in those patients who were treated earlier. So if they received their IV TPA within two hours of symptom onset, and if they got to the endovascular lab within 90 minutes of their IV TPA, these were the groups that showed some trend towards benefit, but again, not statistically significant. Now, another key element of this trial is the quality of the recanalization. Uh, we use the TIKI scoring system to judge how adequate uh, or good a recanalization is. And this scale, as you can see on the slide, ranges from a score of zero, which means no reperfusion, to three, which is full perfusion with filling all of all the distal branches. Uh, the real important part of this scale comes in the middle, where we look at the 2A and 2B categories. 
whereas a Tiki score of 2A it means that you get perfusion of less than half the vascular distribution, and a score of 2B causes a, um, uh, is where you get perfusion of greater than half of the vascular distribution. Now, if we look at the TIKI 2-3 grading, you can actually see the results there don't look too bad. If we get recanalization rates ranging anywhere from 65 up to 81%. But in terms of as uh, interventionalists and stroke physicians, we really are looking for more so for a TIKI 2-B or 3 result. And certainly the conversation that we would have in someone where we were able to achieve a TIKI 2-3 2B or 3 result versus those that we only achieve a TIKI 2A result is going to be much different. Uh, we're going to be certainly more optimistic in those patients where we get a TIKI 2B or 3 result, and so this really is the benchmark of the quality of the recanalization we hope to achieve. Uh, unfortunately, when we look at these numbers, they were not that great in the in the IMS3 trial. They range anywhere there from about, you know, in the ICA 38%, M1s 44%, and really the, we didn't achieve great recanalization results in the results in this clinical trial. Uh, we also, you know, but by mention, should mention the MRS rescue trial, uh, which is another one of these trials published in uh, 2013. Uh, there, the Tiki 2B3 result was only 27%, uh, which means that only one quarter of the vessels that were intended to be opened up were actually able to be opened up uh, in that clinical trial. Uh, the good news from the trial, though, was that reperfusion, as has been demonstrated in previous trials, the better our quality of our reperfusion, the better chance of good outcome. And so those patients who did receive a, a result of a TIKI 2B or 3 did seem to show very good results of a modified Rankin score of 0 to 2 at 90 days. Uh, again, looking at safety, no differences in mortality, symptomatic ICH or parenchymal hematomas. And so from a safety perspective, the good news from this trial is that really there doesn't seem to be an increased safety risk uh, in taking these patients for the endovascular stroke therapy. The other important element of this trial that needs to be addressed is that in terms of patient selection, IMS3 was initiated at a time when there wasn't much imaging of blood vessels being done. And so there was actually no requirement in the clinical trial to be randomized that you actually had to have a large vessel occlusion. And the majority of patients in the trial actually entered it without having a baseline CT angiogram or other type of vessel imaging being performed. Now, if we look at modern-day practice of endovascular stroke therapy, certainly there would not be really any patients that would go to endovascular therapy without having some type of vessel imaging done beforehand. Uh, the good news from, again, from IMS3 is that when we look in the uh, subgroup analysis, this was a post hoc analysis which looked at the patients who actually had a CTA proven occlusion, then when we look at these results, it does come out looking very good for endovascular stroke therapy, uh, particularly looking at those patients who received a modified Rankin scale or who achieved a modified Rankin scale score of zero or one. We see a higher proportion of patients achieving this in the endovascular arm as compared to the IV TPA alone arm. Now, the p-value for this is 0 0.011, and due to it being a secondary analysis, this would be, have to be less than 0 0.01 to be significant. So this is simply a trend, not statistically significant. However, it is a very encouraging trend for those of us who do endovascular stroke therapy. The, the future of endovascular stroke therapy, I think, is pretty bright, and the main reason for that is that I think we're getting much better both in terms of the types of devices that we're using for th this uh, treatment as well as how we're selecting patients for therapy. Um, and so we do have a new class of devices called the stent trievers, which are really allowing us to more effectively and predictably achieve TIKI 2B or 3 results, recanalization results, in much shorter time frames. And these, these results have been shown in the literature in both the SWIFT trial and the Trevo True trial, where compared to older technology in terms of the Mercy Retrieval device, we were getting much better TIKI 2B or 3 results. The other major part of the equation, though, is that we need to be better at selecting patients for this endovascular stroke therapy. We still don't have a consensus as to what the best selection approach is, and really it boils down to really two camps. There's the time-based camp, which argues that time is the most critical factor, and really we should be minimizing imaging before the procedure. And, and certainly, as we've shown with some of the data I, I presented today, that this time is uh, certainly a crucial element. However, there's another camp that really believes that uh, we really should be utilizing imaging, such as MRI scans or CT perfusion, to really help us identify better what the core infarction is, what penumbral tissue is, as well as the collaterals. And by using that, we can perhaps select out the patients who are going to do best with this therapy and also exclude the patients that really don't are not going to benefit from the therapy and we could potentially just be putting at risk. 
And uh, I'd like to share with you guys, with you some data that we have from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we actually instituted our hyperacute MRI protocol in April of 2010 uh, to help us select patients for this endovascular stroke therapy. Before April 30th of 2010, we used to select patients based mainly on CT and CT angiography. And after April 30th, we used to, we used the CT and CTA, but we added on a hyperacute MRI to help us look for core infarction. And the objective of this study was to see whether we actually saw an improvement of outcomes. Uh, looking at the graph that's on the side of the on the slide on the right hand side, uh, we can see that our times to treatment really did not change substantially. One of the major concerns about adding MRI to for selection is that it may add on a lot of additional time. Uh, fortunately, in our study, we did not seem to see any increased time that we were really utilizing the hyperacute MRI in the time when the endovascular suit was being mobilized, uh, using that time period to get this hyperacute MRI, and therefore our time to endovascular therapy first run really was not significantly different between the two groups. But looking at outcomes, we did see that after implementation of the hyperacute MRI, we saw an improvement in outcomes, uh, both when we looked at the overall group of patients uh, who got considered for IA therapy as well as those who just went to interventional therapy. Uh, but this was both a decrease in mortality, which is what you see there in the uh, modified Rankin score, scale score of 6, as well as the proportion of patients who achieved a modified Rankin scale score of 0, 1, or 2. Uh, again, the fact that we see it not only in the inter interventional group but with all patients considered with intervention suggests to us that not only were we taking better patients for the actual therapy, but perhaps not performing the therapy in patients who had larger infarction and uh, really were not going to have much benefit from the therapy, that perhaps we were avoiding harming these patients as well. I'd like to share with you uh, some of the emerging technology that may help us take care of stroke patients in the future. Uh, we here at the Cleveland Clinic are, are pleased to be able to offer one of the first uh, mobile stroke treatment units in the United States. This is really a mobile emergency room that is equipped with point-of-care lab testing as well as a CT scanner on board in the ambulance uh, that allows us to really take the emergency room to the patient in their field, whether they're at home at a, or at another site. Uh, as, as you know, we really cannot make treatment decisions for patients with stroke until we have the CT scan to know whether this is a hemorrhagic stroke versus a ischemic stroke. And being able to do the CT scan at the scene will allow us then to be able to determine which uh, type of stroke the patient has as well as initiate treatment at the scene. Uh, data from Germany uh, in um, Hamburg, which is near the French border, in, in studies uh, that were conducted from the University of Saarland there showed dramatic uh, decreases in time to treatment decisions. Uh, and so this really could be a paradigm that really shifts how we take care of stroke patients in the future. So at the conclusion of this talk, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that time is a critical factor in, the, in acute stroke treatment. Uh, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that IV TPA is an effective medication for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke, and we've now reviewed the guidelines, the new 2013 guidelines that aim to really improve TPA utilization. Um, we really know now from recent published trials that only a subset of patients that were previously eligible for endovascular therapy probably will benefit, but we really do need to select these patients very carefully. And as always, I would encourage that we should apply best practices to standardize the acute stroke treatment, and it really will pay dividends for the stroke population in terms of their management. And I appreciate your time. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Hussein, for that informative talk on the current state of evidence for both intravenous and intraarterial TPA and interventions. The use of mobile stroke technology may represent the future for acute interventions. Obviously, this is an exciting, growing, and evolving field that is going to be developing in the next several years. I hope, Dr. Hussein, that you'll be able to join us in the future and tell us some more about these evolving technologies. And I hope that those listening will also join us for future discussions and talks on acute cerebrovascular disease.